Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Mountain Minds Monday, a program of Tahoe Silicon Mountain. Mountain Minds Monday is the flagship program of our nonprofit. We meet on the second Monday of the month and have been doing that for 11 and a half years now. You can always find us on our YouTube channel. Um, good place to look at our past programs. If you, and if you happen to miss one in the future, you'll find us there. Our other monthly program is an entrepreneur's roundtable called First Friday at Four, which is currently on COVID hiatus. Next month's um, session will be a panel on ski binding technology. So plan to join us on December 13th, 5 p.m. The best way to stay informed of the goings on of Tahoe Silicon Mountain is our email newsletter. We just send it out a few times per month. You can also join the community as part of our Facebook group and certainly subscribe to the YouTube channel. You'll get an alert when we start our next presentation. We do have a suggested donation of $5. We are a 501c3. The best way to make that donation is go to tahoesiliconmountain.com. In the upper right hand corner, there's a donate button. Why donate? There is overhead of being a 501c3, including technology subscriptions, newsletter, and social media support. Tahoe Silicon Mountain is run by an all volunteer board. Um, you too can be a part of the board or a volunteer helping these events happen. We also have several sponsorships. Our gold sponsor and our longest term sponsor is Holland and Hart. Um, Holland and Hart's a law firm with offices based in Reno. Holland and Hart strive to lead their profession by giving the highest level of service and loyalty to their clients and by forging a team lawyers, paralegals, staff, and other professionals whose work is infused with their values. The founder's philosophy was simple, keep going up, and if you get stuck, there's always another route to the top. This is where the spirit of the firm's pioneering and innovation began. Our silver sponsors, one is all, another law firm, Mobo Law, it's a full service law firm started in Truckee. Mobo Law provides excellent representation in an approachable, responsive environment with a human touch. The firm is comprised of attorneys and support staff with integrity and a solid work ethic, providing exceptional work that truly benefits their clients. They love their work and it shows. And our other silver sponsor is Bare Knuckle Branding. It's a branding and marketing company based in Reno that will help your company develop a brand strategy that packs a punch. Bare Knuckle gives you the tools to pull your vision together with an unstoppable brand with a plan. When your business and your branding are aligned, miracles happen. We'd also like to thank all of our community partners, including Nevada County Tech Connection, Tahoe Truckee Media, the Truckee Tahoe Airport, Lyft Workspace, where we're broadcasting from today, and the Truckee Chamber of Commerce. You too can be a sponsor of Tahoe Silicon Mountain, either at this bit.ly link or sending an email to sponsorship at tahoesiliconmountain.com. And without further ado, I'd like to move on to the main event tonight. The title of the talk is Geothermal Energy, the Untapped Renewable Energy Source. The majority of us think of solar or wind energy when it comes to sustainable and renewable energy sources. One source of rarely mentioned un underutilized renewable energy lies to the east of Truckee, California in the Great Basin region of the Western USA, geothermal energy. Tonight, we'll hear Dr. Bridget Ailing speak on unlocking the geothermal energy potential of the Great Basin region. Dr. Ailing is an associate professor at the Nevada Bureau of Mines and Geology and College of Science at UNR Reno. She's also director of UNR's Great Basin Center for Geothermal Energy. She's responsible for developing research and education programs in the field of geothermal energy, overseeing research to understand the complexities of fluid flow in the upper crust and, and the implications of this for geothermal resource exploration and development. Prior to joining UNR in 2016, Dr. Ailing was at Geoscience Australia and the Energy and Geoscience Institute at the University of Utah. 
Dr. Ayling currently serves on the board of directors for the International Geothermal Association and on the Earth Resources Standing Committee for the National Academies of the Sciences, Engineering and Medicine. She's also a proud advocate and member of Women in Geothermal, WING, a global organization that exists to support the professional development and empowerment of women in the geothermal sector. Dr. Ayling holds a BS with honors in geology and physical geography from Victoria University of Wellington, New Zealand. She received her PhD in paleoclimate and environmental geochemistry from the Australian National University in 2006. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Ayling. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Ellen. Okay, hi everyone. I'm Bridget Ayling, and it's my pleasure to be with you here this evening and to be invited to speak um, in one of your monthly seminars. Tonight, I'm gonna to provide a brief overview of uh, geothermal energy in the Western US and um, some information about you know, the, the geoscience aspects of geothermal energy. Uh, as well as some of the research that we're working on here at the University of Nevada, Reno. So as Ellen mentioned, I'm a professor in the Nevada Bureau of Mines and Geology, uh, which is actually Nevada's state geological survey. Um, and it's fully embedded within the University of Reno. Um, so we do work on a range of topics and also focusing on obviously work for the state of Nevada. Okay, so without further ado, let's get started. So tonight I'm going to run through a few different aspects, beginning with, you know, what is geothermal energy and then review a bit about what we know about geothermal energy in the Great Basin region and how much are we using at present. I'll then touch on some of the research questions and challenges um, that face geothermal and finish up with um, briefly mentioning a couple of projects that we're working on here at UNR, uh, mapping hot spring deposits and developing some new predictive exploration tools uh, to help us with our geothermal uh, resource use. So just to begin, very simply, what is geothermal energy? Uh, geo is the earth and thermal is heat. So we're talking about the earth's heat. Uh, fortunately for us, the core of the earth is very hot, over 6,000 degrees Celsius. And we have a lot of heat moving from the center of the earth out to the, the surface. This heat is sourced from two, two key things. One is the primordial heat um, that's left over from when our planet formed um, during the accretion of our planet. And the second source is from the, the radioactive decay of naturally occurring uranium, potassium, and thorium um, that exist in our rocks in the subsurface. So we have a strong geothermal gradient, as we call it, um, with heat moving from hot to cold uh, towards the surface. For geothermal systems, um, there are three things that we really need to have to have a functional geothermal system. Uh, the first is having a heat source. That's really the first key uh, component of any geothermal system. Heat sources can include things like shallow magma bodies, and we often see these around active volcanic systems and sometimes from magma that didn't quite make it to the surface in a volcano. We also have these high heat producing basement rocks that have enriched amounts in uranium, potassium and thorium. And in some locations we have thinner continental crust. Um, so the ocean, for example, the, the crust there is thinner versus the continental crust and places that have been stretched on land where we have a thinner crust here and that heat can escape more readily to the surface. Number two, we need a fluid to move that heat around. That's really important. And this is usually naturally occurring brine or water. And typically this all begins its life as rainwater and circulates through the crust, you know, percolates down uh, into these hot rocks and then usually returns to the surface or the near surface. Number three, we need permeable rocks that those fluids can actually move through. So that means we need you know, open fractures, pore spaces that enable that fluid to get to, you know, to move from A to B. Um, if we don't have permeability, we don't really have fluid circulating um, quite so easily. 
we do have several types of geothermal systems. And on the right here, we have the, the hottest geothermal systems, which have plenty of heat, plenty of fluid and plenty of pathways. And these are typically uh, linked to volcanic and magmatic geothermal systems. As we move to the right on this on the slide here, we start to lose some or in the very far right, um, more than one of these key criteria for a geothermal system. So next on the slide, we have non-volcanic systems. Um, this is usually where we have deep circulation of groundwater, but usually not related to any volcanism today. These systems are usually not quite as hot as the volcanic systems and maybe don't have quite as much permeability as the volcanic systems. Next, we have hot aquifer systems. Uh, we have some geopression systems in the Gulf of Mexico. And then on the far right, we get into this engineered or enhanced geothermal system realm where we have the heat, but we either, you know, we don't have quite enough fluid and maybe no pathways or we're missing the fluid and the pathways. And so these are the engineered systems that require us to actually engineer those reservoirs and potentially inject fluids to make the system work. As we move from left to right, we also have a, a key change here and we start off with convective heat transfer. So we've got fluid circulating, rising upwards via buoyancy forces. Um, and as we move to the right, we lose that permeability and we start getting into conductive heat transfer. So for convection, the hot fluids moving and moving up towards the surface. For conduction, it's the actual, you know, particles themselves are vibrating in the rocks and there's no fluid movement per se. Uh, it's just conduction of heat via molecular vibrations. Um, so that's kind of a, a key change. We really are going to be talking about these non-volcanic systems today, um, which is what we really have in most of the Great Basin region. So where do we find all these kinds of systems in the US? And we are likely to have all of the above. We have hotspot volcanoes in Hawaii and at Yellowstone. We have arc volcanoes here that are linked to the subduction of the Pacific plate beneath the North American plate along the Cascade arc and up in the Aleutians. Uh, we have magmatic systems in California and Nevada and also over in Utah. This is where we've had some cooling magma bodies that didn't quite make it to the surface um, in an eruption and they're still cooling today and providing heat uh, for geothermal systems. We have these non-volcanic geothermal systems where we've got deep groundwater circulating. We've got our hot aquifer systems. There's some of these in Eastern Nevada and in Utah, as well as other places in the US and geopression systems, um, which is linked usually with some of the deep basins in the Gulf of Mexico um, and oil and gas resources down there. So the Great Basin region, why is this really a world-class geothermal province? And it all comes back to the geology of this region. Um, this, this area here is the Great Basin study area that we kind of work in. And uh, fortunately for us, this is a transtensional, extensional part of the North American plate. And the crust is being stretched and pulled apart in kind of a northwest, southeast direction. And that stretching has resulted in both a thinned continental crust, so that means we have higher heat flow, <clears throat> and also lots of active faulting. Um, so that provides lots of, lots of fractures in the rock, lots of breaking of the rock, which provides open fractures for fluids to circulate. Uh, this map here below is the map of the heat flow across the, the whole continent. Um, and we can see that um, most of the Western United States and pretty much most of the Great Basin region has very high heat flow. Uh, and that's due to this crustal extension and thinning um, that has mean we've got a higher, um, higher heat flow beneath the, you know, underneath the Basin Range province. We're also in this really interesting geological province called the Basin and Range. Um, many of you are very familiar with, you know, driving from Reno to Salt Lake City, you go up and down over basins and ranges. And these really reflect the long, interesting geological history of the Great Basin. And it's due to that stretching and that extension. So about 17 million years ago, um, stretching began in the region. 
And as the crust was pulled, we started to create these faults, we call these normal faults, where um, one side drops down and the range kind of like stays behind. As we keep stretching and pulling, whoops, uh, we continue to have more and more faulting. And today, parts of the Great Basin have extended over 100%. So this means that Reno and Salt Lake City used to be twice as close together. And now they've been separated <laughs> by a, a much larger distance due to this extension. And we have many faults to, to indicate that. We're, we're in a very active seismic region. We have a lot of earthquakes. Obviously we have a lot you know, linked to the San Andreas Fault, which is the main plate boundary between the North American and Pacific plates. But we have a lot of activity in the Great Basin as well. All of these little blue lines on this map here are relatively young faults. Young for a geologist is you know, less than a million years or more recent. Um, so this is a product of the extension and fortunately for geothermal systems, recent faulting means that we are creating new open spaces for uh, hot fluids to migrate towards the surface. We know that not every single fault seems to be important for geothermal. Um, about 90% of our known systems in the Great Basin region are associated with four types of fault patterns. Um, so these are shown here below. This is work done by Jim Falls and team here at UNR. Um, and these are particular types of fault geometries. This one's a horse tail, you can kind of see why. Uh, a breach step over or a relay ramp, fault intersections and accommodation zones. These, oh, I'm, I'm clicking my mouse too much. These settings here are complex and as a consequence of the um, interactions and intersections here, we have local stress variations here um, that may allow for dilation and allow for open fractures to be present. So these are the four of the really key settings that we do observe geothermal systems uh, in the Great Basin region today. To look at how those faults relate to the fluids that move around in the geothermal system conceptual model, um, we've got two very schematic diagrams here to illustrate very simply the idea of you know, how these geothermal fluids moving around. So on the left plot here, we have a cross section through one of the ranges into the basin. Um, so these, this is the range front up here, and these are the basins with these infilling sediments. We've got normal faults here along the ranges. In this case, we've got some hot fluid moving up that fault and we have a steam vent at the surface here. If we were to drill a well right here and aim for that upflow zone, we would, we would be successful. You know, we would intersect the, the resource target. In the right, uh, you know, in this right diagram, we have a similar situation. We've got a higher water table. Um, so it's a shallower water table. We do have upflow along one of these range bounding faults and we actually have mixing with some of the cold groundwater that's naturally present in the basin. We have outflow into the basin. This could be several miles from the range front. And then we see a warm spring um, somewhere in the middle of the basin. And this is quite common in Nevada and in the Great Basin. We find hot springs in the middle of nowhere, usually far away from some of the range front areas. If you were an explorer, you would not want to drill a well at that hot spring because you're not actually intersecting where the upflow is. You'd punch through that thermal plume and go back to background gradients underneath that. We really want to be aiming for is this upflow zone here, which is, um, you know, with this fault here. But above that upflow, there's no surface expressions. There's no springs or fumaroles immediately above it. So how do we actually get better about identifying where is that upflow zone location? Luckily in the Great Basin, we have a ton of systems. We have over 400 known geothermal systems. Um, the yellow dots here are systems that are less than boiling and the red are those that are above boiling. Um, so we do have a lot. Many of you would be familiar with some of the springs for soaking, no doubt. Bridgeport um, down at, you know, at, um, a travertine hot springs down Bridgeport is a very popular site. Um, other sites around the, around the state are wonderful for, for soaking. So we have a lot of 
surface expressions of geothermal. In terms of electricity, you know, how we're using it today, um, we have 28 geothermal systems generating electricity across the Great Basin today. And we have an installed capacity of 1200 megawatts or so. Um, most of these green, all these green dots here are plants in the Great Basin. One in California over here, that's the geysers system, which is one of the biggest geothermal systems um, in the US. But in the Great Basin, we have, you know, what we, we call more moderate temperature resources. Um, they vary between about 100 and 260 degrees Celsius. Most are using binary cycle power plants, um, which are more efficient at these lower temperatures. And these essentially use a second working fluid to extract the heat from the geothermal fluid. And that working fluid is the one that gets vaporized to steam and actually spins a turbine. So there's two loops. There's a working fluid loop and the geothermal loop. Geothermal fluids are typically completely re-injected back into the ground to preserve water and reservoir pressures. We also have uh, other applications we call direct use. This means using the heat as is. We don't convert it to electricity. We use the heat to do things for us. So obvious ones are building heating, space heating. Uh, we have vegetable drying. Um, horticulture, like some greenhouses, and up in Oregon, I believe we have a geothermal brewery as well. So we're doing quite a bit already, but we have potential for a lot more. Uh, initial estimates suggest we've got over 7,000 megawatts of undiscovered and identified resources still to tap into um, in the region, which is pretty exciting. In Nevada, um, we do have 17 systems um, as shown here. Um, we've got just over 700 megawatts installed capacity today. And one other interesting thing is we actually have three plants that are solar geothermal hybrids that I'll, I'll mention briefly in a moment. Um, so I think there's more potential for those, those systems in the future. Nevada has been using geothermal for power for uh, going on you know, 35 years now. Um, we, our oldest plant is called Wabuska um, that began in 1985. And we've been steadily increasing our, our generation and capacity. Um, we've got about 23%, we call it parasitic losses. This is because the amount the, the generator makes, we have to also use some power to, um, to power the pumps, the lights on at the power plant. Um, and those, those can take take up some extra power. So we call that a parasitic loss. So the net generation is what goes into the grid to be used by consumers. The right plot here shows how the average price for geothermal has changed in Nevada in cents per kilowatt hour. So in 2020, um, that came to about eight cents per kilowatt hour um, is what they were, they were getting paid essentially for that power. And I dug up some numbers from you know, how does that relate to Nevada's, you know, a residential electricity rate? In Northern Nevada, NV Energy's current rate is 8.6 cents per kilowatt hour. Um, and for you guys up in Truckee, um, the Truckee Donna Public Utility, Utility District rate is 13.2. Um, so a little bit more expensive, um, but yeah, maybe geothermal could help bring that down a bit. In Nevada, almost 10% of our electricity um, that is generated is by geothermal. We're also very strongly dependent on natural gas. Um, solar is increasing every year. Um, hydro is staying pretty constant. You know, there's not, not much more potential for hydro given climate challenges. Um, and coal is staying pretty stable. Hopefully that will be gone in the future. Um, Nevada does have a renewable energy portfolio standard that by 2030, half of our electricity generation will come from renewable energy sources. Um, so that's really exciting to see. Um, these numbers here are for generation. We actually export a, a fair chunk of our geothermal power to California, uh, as well as Utah under some PPAs in those states. Uh, I know the community of Glendale in Southern California, um, they actually got together last year and. Um, wanted to go renewable for their community and they actually 
established a PPA with a geothermal plant in Nevada called Babuska, which is the small plant I mentioned before. Um, and one plant actually sells its power to Utah, to the University of Utah, because the university has a clean energy initiative. Um, so pretty exciting times to see where geothermals plugging in. In California, I also had a look at the numbers. About 6% of the electricity generated in state in California is from geothermal. Uh, and then obviously some is imported from Nevada. Um, so yeah, slightly less generation proportionally, but absolute, you know, California produces a lot more geothermal overall due to the big plants down in the Salton Sea and the geysers. In terms of production, um, we have lots of geothermal wells, obviously, um, that are operational for our power generation. Um, this plot here shows the flow rate at the wellhead in litres per second versus the temperature of the fluid at the wellhead in degrees Celsius. So every dot on this graph is an individual well um, that is being produced for um, energy right now. So and we have a kind of a cutoff around 120 degrees C or 248 degrees Fahrenheit, below which it's really becoming difficult to be economic for geothermal. Most plants are needing temperatures above this to be economic. An exception is Don Campbell, and this plant has very high flow rates. It's got some of the highest flow rates of all plants in the state, and so they can get away with having slightly cooler temperatures for their production fluids. And Wabuska, which is the small plant I mentioned, um, they are actually down below boiling. So this plant is only producing two megawatts net um, and not very efficient, um, but has been producing for 35 years. Um, so it's kind of a success story. Temperatures that are less than you know, 120 or even boiling are ideal for direct use. So that's the heating and cooling opportunity. Um, you know, space heating, space heating, fish farms, greenhouses, de-icing, um, and other industrial applications. Other opportunities are linked to the geothermal solar hybrid systems. I mentioned three systems in Nevada where we have solar PV um, and geothermal working together. Still water actually is even more interesting because it's a triple hybrid. Uh, there's, there's a geothermal plant with a solar PV array and a solar thermal array, which is using concentrated solar um, to help boost the geothermal fluid temperature. And that's one of the first of its kind in the world, I believe, for a triple hybrid system. Other systems include Tuxen Mountain and Petua. And the really cool thing about including solar PV and geothermal, is that the solar PV can offset the production decline that happens during the warm parts of the day. Um, so geothermal plants typically have air-cooled heat exchangers to condense the working fluid that's going through the turbine loop. When it's hot outside, you don't get as good condensing um, ability. And so the blue line here, this is like a day, 24-hour day, the blue line shows the geothermal production, and so it drops during the hot part of the day. Um, if we add solar PV, which is peaking during the hot part of the day, um, you actually do better and you minimize that decline in production during the day and actually boost your overall um, power of the grid. So this is a really cool opportunity, I think, for more of these systems in Nevada and other, other sunny places with geothermal potential. Bring it down to some other direct use examples. The Pepper Mill Hotel in Reno is a really good example of um, how we can use geothermal on a, on a commercial scale here. Um, the Pepper Mill is a pretty large uh, casino and 100% of their hot water uh, and mechanical heat are now supplied by geothermal. Their spa is, is heated by geothermal, their fitness center, swimming pools, and all the domestic water and spaces are heated by geothermal. They've got one production well and one reinjection well, uh, and it saves the hotel about $2 million per year in natural gas costs. So that's really a big success story and it's been operating for a couple of decades, I believe. Um, so that's pretty exciting. 
Also in Reno, we have another example of a residential heating um, application for direct use. And in this case, again, we have one production well, and it actually heats two different communities of homes that are all connected by you know, a geothermal pipe, essentially. And these two estates here, we have a well here producing very hot water, it's almost boiling. Um, and that fluid goes through some heat exchanges here, and that fluid goes through uh, 110 homes in total between these different you know, residential areas, um, and then is re-injected back into the ground. So this saves these homeowners up to 22% uh, on the natural gas bill. Uh, so that's another good application of geothermal. So geothermal, if you're not convinced, you know, what are the benefits? Uh, it's clean, we've got zero to low CO2 footprint. It's base load, which means it's on 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's got a high capacity factor, it's very reliable. It's also good for local communities and economies. It creates jobs, which is really good for these, these regional rural areas in many, many places. It's scalable, we can build smaller plants for small communities or larger plants to, to supply part of the grid. It's renewable. We have stable pricing, no fuel imports required, has a small land use footprint, and it's versatile. We can use it for electricity or for direct use, which has many, many opportunities for uh, applications for heating and cooling. So if it's so great, why are we not using more? And this really relates to, um, there's, there's obviously a few factors here. I'm just gonna speak to the geoscience challenges as to why we aren't using more. One is, you know, how do we locate these new blind geothermal systems that have no surface expression, no hot springs to tell us where they are? And, you know, we think that over 30% of our known systems are hidden. This, uh, this, this model here is a third, a third version of those conceptual models where we have an upflow zone along a fault. We have mixing with groundwater. We've got a lower water table and those fluids just move into the basin and do not ever you know, kind of reach the surface. And so we don't know where that system is. So this is a big challenge. Like how do we find these blind or hidden geothermal systems? Secondly, how do we find the permeability sweet spot? Where are those open fractures? You know, we know that you know, these are usually uh, structurally controlled by, by faulting and complex faulting, but they can be very localized zones that can be quite difficult to target. Also, we're aiming to minimize drilling costs. So we can, you know, we don't want to drill too many bad or dry holes. And finally, optimizing our injection and production well placements to ensure that we can use that resource and manage that resource in a sustainable manner. So in terms of a geothermal development timeline, we, we begin with our surface reconnaissance and our geoscience studies in the first couple of years of a prospect. At this point, our risk level is very high. You know, we have not really proven that we have a resource. Um, in the next years, we start to do some initial drilling to test out some ideas of where we think things might be. And once we start drilling, eventually the risk drops because we confirm, you know, that we have something there that's worth developing. Um, and so this happens in, you know, years two to three, and then big drilling for the really large diameter production wells will be years four to six. Then we commit to building a power plant and the transmission um, interconnector and then operation and maintenance for the long term. So looking at about, you know, eight years plus um, and risk is really highest at the very beginning. And that's where we work here at UNR, trying to address that and see how we can you know, support explorers and reducing that exploration risk. Just for some context about depths of wells, people always ask me, how deep do I have to go to get geothermal? And it depends on what you want to use it for. Um, for power production in Nevada, um, we have a range of depths of wells, depending on the local geology. But the shallowest wells are you know, less than 500 metres, um, one and a half thousand feet. Um, some are even very, very shallow, 200 metres deep um, for fluid production and some are over 8,000 feet deep. So we can see here, we have kind of a tailing off. We've got some wells that are very deep. Most I'd say are less than a thousand meters, like 3,000 feet. 
Um, and yeah, obviously as you go deeper, it gets more expensive. Well costs vary. These fluctuate all the time depending on demand for rigs. But for a production well, which is a full size, uh, large diameter well, it could be looking at three to $4 million for a well. Slim holes are uh, slimmer versions of those wells. They could be a bit cheaper. A shallow core hole, maybe half a million. And the cheapest well that we drill very early on is the thermal gradient hole that might be $200,000, depending on how deep you wanna go. So it's not a cheap prospect and you want to make sure that when you do do drill, you are really confident that you're doing your best to target that location before you commit to spending millions of dollars. So at UNR, what are we doing to you know, help explorers and encourage the uptake of geothermal energy development? Uh, a few things we're working on answering. You know, what are the controls on geothermal fluid flow? i.e. why do these systems occur where they do? Secondly, what are their characteristics? You know, what is the system geometry? Um, where do we typically find the, the fluid recharge location, the upflow zones where the really hot fluids coming up, the outflow locations? What does the chemistry look like? Temperature regime, lifespan? Do these things naturally ebb and flow? And obviously resource capacity as well. How much could we actually produce? Thirdly, how do we use those, those um, answers for one and two essentially to improve our chances of discovering commercially viable hidden systems in the state? So I'm gonna briefly review a couple of, of areas of interest that we're working on. Um, we have a lot going on. So um, given time, I'll just mention two things that we're working on that I think are pretty exciting. One is mapping hot spring deposits. Hot spring deposits can be silica-based. These include sinter or silicified sediments, or they can be calcium carbonate dominated, including travertine and tufa. We find these throughout the Great Basin region, and they provide an important snapshot of the, the geothermal and the hydrological conditions that were present when that deposit formed. Because they can be preserved for a long time after hot spring discharge has stopped, they are a really valuable exploration tool. So we're working on um, mapping and characterizing these deposits across the Great Basin to help us understand you know, how we can use these um, to guide our exploration. This photo here is from a, a now extinct hot spring uh, in Railroad Valley, which is kind of Eastern Nevada. Um, and we had, this is a fossil travertine um, you know, vent here, I suppose, there was hot fluid running down this here, like a big finger, uh, depositing calcium carbonate. Some of our goals, we, we want to actually do a big database compilation here of all the locations that we know about of, you know, by either, you know, the Tufa, Travertine and Sinter, and then characterize these deposits and ultimately link those characteristics to geothermal system characteristics such as geothermal fluid chemistry, temperature, hydrology, flow, um, and proximity to the upflow location. Also like to look at, you know, can we look at these fossil deposits and learn something about the lifespan and the cyclicity of these geothermal systems in the region? So here I'm showing some examples of silica-based deposits. Um, these are opaline silica. And silica deposits are a type that geothermal explorers get very excited about because the, the chemistry and the kinetics of silica in solution means that if we see sinter on the surface, that we must have had temperatures in the subsurface that were above 175 degrees Celsius when that deposit was being formed. Now that is above the, the, the cutoff for power generation. That's a pretty good resource. So if we come across sinter in the field and we think it's kind of young, young-ish, we get pretty excited about that because that indicates a pretty substantial geothermal system at some point in the near, near past. So we have some examples here from Steamboat Hot Springs um, just south of Reno. And you can see this kind of banded laminated silica sinter. Um, McGinnis Hills in central Nevada has a large extinct sinter mound and Granite Springs Valley as well as an example here of, of these deposits. 
one type of sinter that I get pretty jazzed about is geyserite. So geyserite uh, is formed uh, when you have a geysering spring or a bubbling boiling spring and the the near vent locations that are intermittently being wet and dried with this silica saturated fluid forms these kind of nodular type growths. Um, and we have some fossil geyserite in a few places in Nevada. Um, we have no more geysers today, unfortunately. But in Dixie Valley, we have a fault called the Dixie Valley Fault that has ruptured multiple times in the past. And we see fossil geyserite. So you can see this, this deposit here uh, with these kind of radiating bundles and little nodules of silica. Um, this is a close up here. This is under the microscope here, looking at down at the thin section view. Um, and this is probably linked to rupture events, i.e. earthquakes on the Dixie Valley Fault in the past. With each earthquake, we had some temporary permeability. We had open spaces, we had fractures, and we had boiling springs on the fault trace at the edge of the basin. And with time, those fractures were sealed up most likely with new minerals and closed up and we have no more activity today. So this has happened in the past and if we have another earthquake again on that fault, um, maybe we'll, we'll see some more, more geysers and boiling springs. Here's an example in Peru of geyserite forming in situ. This is a boiling spring up in the Andes and we can see these little nodules here on the periphery of this hot spring as the geyserites forming with this bubbling, boiling water. So, um, yeah, pretty exciting. We also have silica cemented sands and muds. Um, we have many sands and muds and sediments in the basin range and each of the basins. And so we these form when hot geothermal fluids move through those surface sediments and cement the grains together. So we have many forms here with root casts and vegetation in situ. Uh, and these are also really important indicators of geothermal activity in the past. And a few pics here under the microscope, you know, we look closely at these things and trying to figure out, you know, what happened and how these, these cements formed. Uh, and if there's information there that we can use to tell us about the, you know, the geothermal system and other characteristics. Results to date, um, this is still work in progress. We're ongoing doing this work and actually more regionally as well. Uh, we have many sites that have deposits. Most of these silica uh, cemented sites are not active today. There's no hot spring there today, um, but most are linked with a known geothermal system that's maybe now blind. And the reasons for them not being active today is probably due to hydrology. So if water tables drop, um, we're not going to have as many springs at the surface and that could be natural. We've had big changes with in the past with, you know, during glacial times, um, Lake Lahontan was a very large paleo lake that was in the region and um, we probably had higher water tables during that climate. Um, it could be fault driven, you know, when these faults rupture, they temporarily open up some new fracture pathways. And in some cases it could be human induced, you know, some of the geothermal plants when they first started producing, weren't operating quite as sustainably as they could have. They didn't know it was, you know, first applications of this um, and some pressure drawdown in the reservoir means that there's no longer surface springs. Most travertine sites are selected active now and tufas are not. Tufas form underwater um, in lakes and lake bottoms. We may be forming some in Pyramid Lake today. If you went for a scuba dive, maybe you'd see some forming today. Um, but these are typically formed um, subaqueously. So it works on going for this project and yeah, watch the space. So I'd like to finish up mentioning a, another of our initiatives that's really focused on developing predictive exploration workflows. And this is to ultimately help explorers um, and help the community uh, discover and develop new geothermal resources to help us meet clean energy targets. Um, in the US. So our goals include identifying and mapping out our potential on a regional scale, improving our identification of hidden systems, these blind geothermal systems, uh, help to prioritize sites in a quantitative manner because we may want to you know, do more data collection 
that which sites are the best to invest our limited funding and time to do that. And hopefully through developing methods and testing our methods, we actually reduce the expiration risk for these resources. So we've been fortunate to receive funding from the Department of Energy um, for several projects recently. Uh, the, a big one was called the Nevada Geothermal Play Fairway Project uh, that began in 2015, uh, led by Jim Falls here at UNR. That project fed into the next phase of funding, which was looking at applying machine learning uh, to exploration for geothermal. And then most recently, we received uh, funding last year for a big project that builds on those two projects and other previous work um, to accelerate the reduction of exploration risk in the Great Basin region. This one's called Ingenious. Um, the long title is Innovative Geothermal Exploration Through Novel Investigations of Undiscovered Systems. I'm the PI on this one. Um, you and I is the lead institution and we have a strong team with um, 12 external partners and some fantastic people that we're working with and collaborating with. Um, this is also through the Department of Energy's Geothermal Technologies Office. Um, we began this year in February and we have a pretty big budget, $10 million over four and a half years. Much of that will go towards exploration drilling and testing to, to validate our new workflows. So it's a pretty exciting time. So just to recap a bit on the Play Fairway and how that came to be. So Play Fairway, you might be asking, what is Play Fairway? That's kind of a strange term. Uh, it stems from actually the oil and gas industry. And uh, the, the fairway is like the golf analogy. The fairway is where you want to hit the ball, not off, not off the fairway. Um, and the play, you know, is the locations that actually have all the ingredients you need for a viable system. So for geothermal, that means heat, fluid, and permeability. So which fairways, you know, which locations have all those ingredients present for us to actually I want to do more exploration? So this meant we combined a ton of different data sets. Um, I won't walk you through this plot on the right, um, but lots of different data sets to tell us about the permeability. You know, do we have permeability? What, what's the potential for permeability? Um, heat source, you know, do we have enough heat? Um, and ultimately we get to this, the fairway, right? Which is the areas that look favorable for geothermal. Um, so this project was very successful. Um, this is the map that was produced. So we can see the map here in Nevada, it's most of the state. Hotter colors here indicate higher potential for geothermal and the colder colors relatively less potential. Um, so it's a very large part of the state um, that was completed during the phase one of the project. In phase two, uh, work was done on five sites, some more detailed work, a new data collection, um, to really get into the weeds and figure out, you know, do we have um, geothermal potential at those sites? In phase three, we actually, actually did some test drilling. So two sites were drilled down in uh, southern Gabs Valley and in Granite Springs Valley. And both, both sites were successful in that we discovered some new hidden geothermal systems. Um, so this was really a, a you know, proof that this predictive exploration workflow was able to identify new hidden geothermal resources. At Gabs Valley, we, we encountered temperatures above 124 degrees C at quite shallow depths. In Granite Springs Valley, we didn't get quite as hot, it was almost boiling, but again at pretty shallow depths. So um, this is really exciting for us and you know, we hope we can find more of these systems in our, our future projects. Building on that, so we had the Play Fairway project finish up and funding was available for machine learning. The community, the geothermal community more broadly has been evaluating how can we use some of these new tools that are out there now, machine learning, AI, um, to do even better with our predictive workflows. And so that project there, we really want to develop an algorithmic approach and help us identify new systems in the region. And so this project is, is finishing up now. Um, we are working on the results. You know, we found some very interesting things. 
arguably we're still working through how to interpret some of those results and how to use them in practice. Uh, machine learning is a very powerful tool and also quite complicated at times. Um, so this is kind of ongoing work to see how we can integrate it effectively in an exploration workflow that explorers can actually use in the field. Um, so it was a really exciting project that we're still kind of working on. And then we have Ingenious. So this is the new big project that's just started. Um, the red boxes here are the previous Play Fairway projects. Here's Nevada's project here covering much of the state. For Ingenious, we're looking at this broad area here with this white dashed line. So we're really going pretty big and we have some pretty ambitious goals. We want to develop a new prospectivity map for the whole region and compile all the data sets that we need to do that, um, which is a big effort. We also want to develop some software tools that explorers can use themselves to actually you know, apply and adopt this workflow that we're working on. We are doing some detailed case studies at a few sites and doing advanced 3D modeling and ultimately also doing some test drilling. So we do want to validate our models and see you know, what are we learning? Are we missing anything? Are we being um, successful in predicting new geothermal locations? At the end of the day, we want to produce a what we call a developer's playbook um, that includes, from our experiences on this project and other experiences, uh, the best practices for geothermal exploration in the Great Basin region. One tool that we're using, that I'll just touch on as my last slide, is the shallow temperature surveys. We use these two meter probes that we hammer into the ground using a demolition hammer. Uh, we then actually put a, a resistor into the probe and at two meters down, we can actually pick up subtle thermal, thermal anomalies in the subsurface that might provide some clues that we might have a geothermal system beneath our feet. So we do these surveys um, in our case study locations to see if we can pick up any anomalies there that might clue us into where we have a geothermal system. So this is one of our field techniques. We have many others, geophysics, geochemistry, mapping. Um, I haven't got time to review them all, but um, you can see a website for more information on this. So that was my last slide. So I want to acknowledge um, startup funds that I've received here in the past from our VPRI office at UNR, uh, the Department of Energy, Geothermal Office for funding some of our research, the Division of Minerals here in Nevada, and of course, the great team we have here in the Great Basin Center. Um, we're doing some really exciting things and I encourage you to check out our website. Um, we try and keep things up to date there with our project work and um, new activities. And feel free to send me an email if you have questions about what, what we're doing. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for paying attention tonight and enjoy the rest of the evening. So we're gonna move into the Q&A now. And um, Dr. Ailing, I hope it's okay if we go a little bit past six, there's a lot of questions in the YouTube channel. Okay, um, no problem. So uh, one question, please explain more about any potential pollution challenges for um, harvesting the geothermal energy. I would say there's very few, you know, geothermal is a very clean energy source. Um, the, the only thing you, you know, need to really worry about is the water that you're harvesting. Typically, as I mentioned, most of the geothermal fluids are just salt water, like brines, that have been circulating in the subsurface for a while. Um, and in some cases, there might be other things in the brine that you want to be careful about, um, like very, very small amounts of things like arsenic or um, other other heavy metals that can be in the fluid sometimes, but these are managed because all the fluids that we produce go back into the ground. Uh, and so they go back into the earth and to recirculate um, in the subsurface. So in terms of pollution, I would say there's really not a lot to, it's really a, one of the wonderful clean energy sources. You know, there's very, very, very low amounts of CO2 emissions um, for, for these plants. And it's, yeah, not a lot to, to point to for pollution, fortunately. Great. Um, can you comment on what role the instability of the grid might inhibit further implementation of geothermal power? Sure. 
Yeah, and that's a big one with the renewable push and, you know, how do we deal with these intermittent generators like solar and wind? Obviously, battery storage has been one solution. Um, one thing about geothermal is because it is base load and it's always on, um, that can just be, it actually helps to improve the reliability of the grid because it isn't intermittent. It's just 24-7 producing. Um, so that can serve to kind of stabilise you know, flux, you know, fluctuations in demand and supply is actually a benefit for the grid. Um, yeah. Um, can you talk at all about what kind of maintenance geothermal plants require? Maintenance. Well, that's, I'm not a, a power plant engineer, um, but, you know, they do require maintenance like everything. Um, you know, the geothermal wells typically you know, every few years, depending on where you are, um, the wells might have to be cleaned out. So they, um, because there's, you know, dissolved minerals in those brines that they attach to the, the casing of the well sometimes. And so every few years, you might have to do what, what's called a clean out and put like a little drill down there and clean out the pipe. Um, the plant itself, you know, you need to maintain the generators and the pumps, you know, just standard mechanical maintenance. Um, you know, for commercial units, that's just part of the part of the package. Um, I'd say some of the newer binary systems are getting more and more low maintenance and require even less and less um, kind of hands-on work to keep them running. And they're very reliable. You know, like geothermal plants can operate for decades. You know, as long as they're maintained and serviced appropriately, um, they're very reliable for the long term. Great. What other exploration te techniques are currently used to locate potential geothermal sources? Gravity, magnetics, mm -hmm. seismic, mm -hmm. drones? Yep, all of the above. And we're using them all. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's, we're throwing everything at it for ingenious. Um, you know, we've got, yeah, we're doing gravity surveys, magnetics, magnetotellurics. Um, we're using seismic reflection where we have those data previously. They're very expensive to acquire. So, um, we are looking at drone mounted aeromagnetics. Um, LIDAR is a key one, which is like high resolution elevation information. That's really key for mapping out fault traces where you have a scarp where the fault is. Um, fluid chemistry, um, there's some gas, soil gas surveys sometimes can be useful where you might have small amounts of um, you know, either CO2 or helium leaking out through the crust and you might pick up an anomaly in soil gas. Um, but I'd say all of those things that you mentioned we are doing mm -hmm. and I guess part of Ingenius's goal is to incorporate those together, optimise how we um, kind of synthesise those data sets and actually hopefully get to a better outcome in terms of locating new systems. Great. Um, we'll see. When you identify potential sites, what happens next? How do they get developed? So I, I know you had a little bit of the timeline, but you know, what's the handoff between the research that you do and the commercial development? Great question. So typically, if we've picked up on areas that look interesting, obviously the university, we're not going to develop a resource ourselves. Um, but what typically happens is, you know, and it's happened previously, the BLM are keeping an eye on work that we're doing and, and industry as well. Um, and some of those areas may get nominated for geothermal lease sales the following year as acreage. You know, the BLM will evaluate locations there and see if they make, make, make sense to release for geothermal exploration. Um, and in some cases, parcels can be nominated individually, you know, um, uh, non-competitively. So typically that's the, the next step to get them actually released, uh, if it's federal land that is, um, you know, released through the BLM kind of annual lease sale and developers mm -hmm. will bid, bid on parcels and put their price in and hopefully walk away with a parcel that they can explore. Uh, and then hopefully that company in good faith is then investing in further exploration, probably some drilling to really prove out and test that area. Um, so that's typically the process. If you're working with a private land area, you could reach out to the private landowner directly and get started kind of sooner. So um, 
yeah, that's the process in a nutshell. Yeah. Is there any funding in the new infrastructure bill to help catalyze the use of geothermal? I mean, I know this is very new, so I don't know how closely you've been able to look at it. Yeah, honestly, I'm not too familiar. I, I believe so. Um, I believe there is a chunk of funding in there for geothermal, you know, through the DOE, GTO. Um, but I honestly, I couldn't give a number, but I, I believe it is in there. I know the Biden administration is supportive of clean energy, obviously, um, but I don't have a number for you. Is there... Um... Is there work being done to reduce the the loss in the plants? Um, I can't remember what what you called the um, the loss, the parasitic. overhead. Yeah, yeah, parasitic losses. Yeah, yes, and that's really so. There's two probably probably more than two, but two key things to speak to that. One is you know improving the plant technology all the time, and so you know Ormet are one of the big operators here in Nevada and you know, really started out as kind of turbine manufacturers there and um, with their binary cycle technology. And that's just being improved all the time and getting more and more efficient so that that parasitic loss hopefully gets reduced. Um, so there is, and there's other companies developing other binary systems too, and, you know, similar idea, but really trying to optimize the technology. Um, the other thing is, you know, it is inevitable that you're going to have some parasitic losses. Most of the resources in the Great Basin are pumped. You know, this means that there's a downhole pump in the well that's really pumping the water to the surface. They're not flowing naturally by themselves. And those pumps can be big and pretty, pretty thirsty for, for power. Um, so this is where things like solar, adding in a few solar PV panels, um, can kind of supplement that geothermal and offset that parasitic loss. Got it. Um, another question, what investment will be needed to connect the remote geothermal production sites to the electrical grid? Oh, good question. Um, I don't know actually what that number would be for transmission line connections. Um, yeah, I can't answer that. Sorry. I mean, it's, it can be expensive if you're far from an existing, you know, uh, a grid connection, but operators do it, you know, all men have done it multiple times and you know seem to make it you know they still get their payback so it is doable it's not it's not the only barrier absolutely not yeah good well we there are some specific questions about specific areas in Nevada and, and that sort of thing and maybe we'll take that offline um, but just so much interest from from our audience and they love the ability to ask the questions so thank you for for staying on a few minutes extra um, such an informative talk and we, we've really enjoyed it. Thank you for making the time to spend with us. No problem. Thank you very much for the invitation. It was a pleasure. And yeah, feel free to reach out with further questions. Great. And for the rest of the audience, I just want to remind you that we meet the second Monday of the month each month. So in December, that'll be December 13th. And the topic will be a panel discussion on advances and innovations in ski binding technology. So with that, I'm gonna wrap things up and thank you all for joining.